Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Frontline Club. Uh, I'm Bill Neely, the international editor of ITV News, and I'm delighted to finally make it here after um, being uh, on uh, the panel for various um, discussions from Mexico to Iran and Afghanistan and not managing to make a single one. So it's great to be here to talk uh, about <coughs> Iraq. Ironically, I suppose now we might almost call it the forgotten war as we become absorbed in Afghanistan, it's almost like the two wars have flipped places, but perhaps Iraq is the most contentious war uh, of the modern era. 179 British dead, almost slipping into history now, but of course countless thousands of Iraqi uh, dead. Um, and just in case you haven't uh, been paying attention or been completely up to date on Iraq events, let me just run through just a few things that have been in the papers this week about Iraq. Um, of course, the MOD um, has managed to shoot itself not just in the foot but in the head uh, again this week, trying to cut the compensation for injured soldiers, injured soldiers from Iraq as well as Afghanistan. Um, today we learned uh, that Britain has been forced to pull out its remaining 150 naval personnel from Iraq because Iraq's parliament has failed to extend their right to stay. The mandate allowing British troops to stay in Iraq, of course, expires on Saturday, and there is no new deal in the Iraqi parliament. Today, also, the Foreign Office announced two more of those five British hostages who were kidnapped almost two years ago are almost certainly dead, leaving one possible uh, survivor, although you have to worry about his uh, future. And, of course, that opens up questions about the government's handling of those hostage negotiations. Meanwhile, troops continue to die in Iraq. Uh, three American troops killed uh, last week in a base near Basra in a rocket attack, a base that British troops occupied until not long ago. And tomorrow, tomorrow morning, Sir John Chilcott will announce how he will conduct his inquiry into Iraq and the terms of reference and some of the personnel uh, of that inquiry. There is, of course, public concern about that inquiry, and I just learned that the uh, press conference will be at 11.30 tomorrow morning, and Sir John Chilcott will not take questions, which is interesting uh, in itself. Um, as you know, there were bomb attacks in Baghdad uh, just yesterday as the U.S. Defense Secretary uh, Gates arrived, uh, praising Iraqi forces who, of course, took over security responsibility for U.S. troops in Iraq less than a month ago. That is the news from Iraq, as we are all, I suppose, consumed by the pictures from Wooten Bassett and from Afghanistan of a war that is now uh, consuming our attention. So here to talk about Iraq tonight, we had hoped to have General Sir Mike Jackson, but he um, was unable to attend, um, possibly because of the trenchant criticism <laughs> of him and others in this book uh, by the guest to my right, uh, Richard North, who is a defence analyst, a former research director in the European Parliament and author of another book called The Great Deception, A History of the European Union. Um, Richard North has written, um, in many respects, a devastating book and is to be credited uh, with highlighting the vulnerability of the Snatch Land Rover, which I think you call an icon of Britain's <laughs> defeat in Iraq um, and are to be credited, I suppose, with highlighting uh, that issue. Um, with uh, me also, and no doubt um, will be a subject of Richard North's um, criticisms, are Kim Sam Gupta, the defence correspondent of the Independent, a man who I've seen in many places in Iraq and Afghanistan over the years, and another witness to war, Deborah Haynes, the defence correspondent of The Times. Um, we are going to break tradition tonight at the Frontline Club because Richard is going to give us a PowerPoint demonstration or presentation which he assures me will last 10 minutes. I will be counting because I'm not a great fan of PowerPoint <laughs> presentations. But anyway, um, and part of it will be, I think, very, very useful because part of Richard's um, book is about equipment and how procurement and the type of equipment that was used in Iraq let the army down. So it's, of course, useful to see exactly what equipment we're talking about. So we will start off with, with both that and uh, a few points 
made by the panel, and then we will throw it open for questions and hopefully get a debate going. So, without further ado. Richard. The management bill you'd be pleased to know have deliciously sabotaged me by running the computer out of the battery. <laughs> so the PowerPoint has now died. Ah. <laughs> so and we haven't got a plug. However, I will keep talking. And hopefully they'll there. Uh, there, which of course has completely thrown me, uh, because uh, those of us that have uh, are old hands at lecturing in, in other environments, the PowerPoint is actually the the the, the, the comfort blanket by, uh, around which we can conceal ourselves. So bereft of that, I'm actually going to have to think and use the brain cells. Now, what I was going to tell you, he says, were. Well, basically two things. From a, a very long book, and in fact, uh, at lunchtime I, I had a small gathering where I tried to summarize the book, and I did a very short version very fast, and it took an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly I cannot even begin to uh, cover the depth of the book uh, the, 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 and, and, and the various arguments we write. Bill tells me that at some parts he was screaming with agreement and delightfully, I'm very pleased to hear at other times he was absolutely outraged and, and protesting and disagreeing violently. I should hope it should be so because what motivated me to write the book was a succession of generals who obviously had worked out the line to take, almost word perfect, who were standing up saying that uh, the Iraqi experience, uh, we went there to do a job, uh, we did the job we set out to do, the men can walk out, heads held high. Well, indeed, the men can, but the management, if you like, the high command cannot, because any which way you look at this, uh, as a military venture and as a political venture, it was a failure, and a major failure at that. Now, what I wanted to do, as I say, with a with, with PowerPoint, was to give you a structure of the campaign as I saw it, and that went to five parts, where basically we had the uh, honeymoon period for, for, from May through to about October, where it looked where everything initially was going to be uh, all touchy-feely, nicey-nicey, and the uh, British moving in to liberate the Shia was again, uh, and hold hands together and walk into the sunset with a, with a wonderful new democratic Iraq. Uh, that vision, if you like, and I'm obviously hopelessly parodying it, didn't materialize. And by through the August, with, with, with the August riots and uh, with successive bomb attacks occurring, uh, we saw the emergence of a, brilliant, uh, a counterinsurgency. Let's see if this works. This is. Continue the system resume, it says, one of those. And this will self-destruct in three seconds. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, we had the phase one, but from that, the emergence of the Mahdi army led by Muqtada al-Sada as the dominant uh, force who has become the major force within the politics of, of southern Iraq, and, and in fact, Iraq generally. Uh, who made the tactical mistake of taking on the British Army full frontal, and the American Army, of course, up at Najif and elsewhere. And through 2004, from, I think it was April, wasn't it? Uh, May, through to August, were in fact roundly defeated. Lost uh, a great deal of men, uh, a lot of material, and excuse me while I do this as well, uh, and was set back very substantially and did not really recover until 2005. Now we've got the uh, PowerPoint back. Let's see if it actually works. So we should have this slide. If it... Sorry. Mice and men and all that. Right, OK. Well, that's where I was going to start was what brought me into the story. 
and brought me in hard after being watching it from distance. And I'd run a blog for some years. And I was uh, building a picture. And one thing that emerged in my own mind was Land Rovers. And without being able to, at that time, having tied it together, there seemed to be a lot of Land Rovers going down, a lot of people being killed in Land Rovers. So I did a research trawl, all the sources I could find, and came up with a figure which at the time was quite stunning. And I, I seem to remember at the time, this was June 2006, 26 separate incidents of fatalities, which was the largest single cause uh, of fatality within the Iraqi campaign. Now, that was the trigger, and I'll return to that quick uh, in a moment. But here I was talking about the five parts. So we had the honeymoon. We had the full-blown insurgency, where they took the army, both the American army and the British army, head on and lost. But then they reverted to the classic guerrilla warfare. And it was at that phase that the British Army was temperamentally uh, and physically ill-equipped to deal with, and in particular ways was totally unprepared. And it was at that phase which uh, I believe set the route for the eventual failure of the campaign. And while all the focus is on Basra, I believe the strategic error and the point at which the campaign was lost was in the failure to defend the base at Abu Naji, the failure to deal with IEDs and the failure to deal with, with, with indirect fire, and eventually the decision in August 2000, what were we talking about, 2006, 2007, to abandon Abu Naji, which uh, left al Amara in the hands of the Mahdi, which actually became a major bomb factory, where they're actually building IEDs on an industrial scale. And we saw that later, after the media had actually stopped taking interest. It was then that the army moved out of al Amara in order to focus on Basra, which was, if you like, trying to mop the bathroom floor from a spilled bath without turning off the tap. Because armaments and particular IEDs were flooding into Basra. And of course, we were taking the hits, and without the equipment and the ability, we didn't know how to deal with it. Gradually, we were withdrawn into the bases, and eventually, as we know, we ended up in uh, Basra Air Base, which brought us to the final stage, where with us basically, and we were talking about this, Bill, weren't we, earlier, with, with the British basically hunkered down in Basra Air Station, the Iraqi army, backed by the uh, American forces, recovered Basra, now, that got the highlight, but actually the bigger, um, that was Charge of the Knights, but actually the bigger and more important action came the following May in Al Amara when the 10th Division, oddly enough, with the 10th Mountain Brigade, uh, 10th Mountain Division, plus elements of the 82nd Airborne, with a huge amount of air power, recovered Al Amara. And when they went in there, the inventory of the uh, bomb factories and the bombs that they found is quite staggering. It was measured in thousands. And within two months, combat engineers throughout uh, Iraq were reporting that the insurgents were actually running out of bombs. And what became very clear was Al Amara had been the bomb factory supplying most of the sheer insurgency. And in walking away from Al Amara, that created the problem. <coughs> now, very quickly, and here's where the picks come, and I promised 10 minutes, so it'll be 10 minutes. Part of my argument, but only part, is that whatever plan you have for an insurgency, there are precursors. In order to implement that plan in a modern democratic environment, you need three things. First of all is road security. In other words, you have to be able to move round to do whatever it is you're going to do without losing people. Secondly, you have to have base security because if you hunker back down in your base and you start losing people there and you can't safeguard your bases, then equally you're going to take casualties and that's going to reflect back uh, on public sentiment and erode the political will to continue. 
And all that then combines in essentially the core thesis that the precursor to fighting, uh, or, or rather in order to win a uh, counterinsurgency, you can lose it on the battlefield, sorry, you can win it on the battlefield, but you are more likely to lose it not in on that battlefield, but on the home front, when you start losing people and when you start failing to tell the home front or convince the home front that you're taking the action to protect the troops. So you have to win that home front battle as well as the foreign battle. And I believe that it was that <coughs> battle that we lost, which in fact eroded the will, both of the army and the politicians, to continue the battle. So that while uh, huge effort was going in observing the battle in Iraq, much of the real battle and most of the losses were actually happening here in, in, in England. Now, arguably, and it is arguable, and I have enormous arguments with all sorts of people, this was an equipment war because force protection, as it generically known, requires a very specific set of equipment. Now, recently we've been hearing, this is why I chose this little bit of a broader argument. We've been hearing a lot on the news about shortfalls of equipment, the wrong sort of equipment, Mostly, I'm afraid, and I'm afraid wrongly, focused on helicopters. So, hence the PowerPoint. I wanted to show you some pictures of some of the range of equipment which we didn't have, should have, still haven't got, and even if we did, don't know how to use it. So that's the next 15 slides. I'm going to run through them very quickly. Uh, he said, <coughs> it doesn't mess it around again. Let's try it. Now, first of all, the weapons. The two weapon sets were indirect fire and that's mortars and also the, supposedly, some of them were uh, either Iranian or Chinese 107 uh, free flight rockets, unguided rockets. They caused absolute havoc in the bases, caused a lot of losses and a lot of material losses, but also constrained our mobility in, the, in that, certainly in Abu Naji and elsewhere, it became very dangerous to bring in helicopters, which also constrained our freedom of movement. Uh, no picture of rockets, but you get the feeling. Now, uh, sorry, this is... The other weapon, and this turned out to be the strategic weapon, the killer weapon, was the IED, broadly. Now, this was how they found them initially, classically, uh, either 152 if they were Russian or 155 mil shells, six inches, basically, and on the right is the anti-tank mine. But the, the killer was this one, the uh, EFP, as it's known, the exposedly formed uh, projectile, against which the British failed to develop any counter in the context of fueling Land Rovers, which provided absolutely no protection. And this is both the scandal and the failure, because the British both knew about the weapon, <coughs> knew its potential, knew it was around, and knew absolutely it was going to be deployed, and took absolutely no precautions to prevent troops being killed by them, sending them out in Land Rovers, which they knew were wholly inadequate, basically sent them out to die, knowing that if they got hit, they were going to die. It was simple as that, and they knew it. That was the EFP. And it turned out, for the Iraqis, in a sense, a war winner. So let's look at the countermeasures. Now, what brought us on to this was, in 2006, very early, uh, and in fact, much earlier, the, the US Marines, of course, had been focused on the same problem we had, IEDs, and they started introducing a range of South African vehicles, this being one of them, the RG31. And up in, in uh, late January 2006, they put up a picture on their US Marine Corps website with an RG31 <coughs> that had the worst possible episode of an IED, which is straight under the center line. And the crew walked out unharmed. I think one of them suffered a broken rib. The other one had to take two days off with a headache. Now, at the time when uh, we were losing people, very substantially, here was the US Marine Corps saying, hey. And they came up by that time with 200 IED hits on their vehicles, their protected vehicles, with no mortality, no fatalities at all. So we put the two and two together, put it through Parliament, and I must say the press worked then, with a combination of the Sunday Telegraph, the Sunday Times, your, your sister paper, uh, and some very active intervention in Parliament. We raised this issue hard, and it took off. But it was only a tiny part of the story, and unfortunately, we didn't see the rest of the part, uh, story being taken on. 
Now, the story was about protected vehicles, but it shouldn't have been and wasn't, and wasn't the whole story. Because in 2005, and, and this I find totally unacceptable, because of the vulnerability of these vehicles, we adopted an almost barbaric procedure of stopping vehicle convoys short of danger points, via VPs as they call them, like junctions. So they'd stop a convoy about 100 yards short and then send men forward on foot to search the junctions and the litter around the junctions to see if there were any bombs there. So that you had soldiers rooting among rubbish looking for bombs which at the time were heat triggered. And San Hickey, Colson Guards, October uh, 2005, was doing precisely that to protect his men and gone ahead of his own convoy, walked in front of a heat sensor of a uh, IED, an EFP, and it cut him in half. Now what they should have been using was this kit, which had been in theatre since 2003. It's called a Buffalo, and to give you some idea of what it does, you see the next picture, this extendable arm, and it can rummage around in the debris, or it can look at holes, it can ferret around, and exactly designed to deal with EFPs, which are not buried, they can't be buried, and that is what can find them. And that'll take the hit, and so far, of the thousands of hits, they've taken over 2,600 hits at last count. There's only ever been one casualty. That is the beast. Now, interestingly, this is a very important picture because the one you saw earlier was an American one. This one is not Iraq. It's Afghanistan. It's an American bought machine, but it's owned by the French. We put parliamentary questions up in 2005 asking, why aren't we buying this kit? And the MOD said, not necessary. They ordered it last October. We don't get it until 2010. The French got it, the Canadians got it, the Americans got it, we haven't. And they're telling us they're doing their job. I don't believe it. This second piece of kit is called Husky. Now you see these wonderful pictures of men walking down the streets with mine detectors. It is out of the Iron Age. You see the, the MOD pictures. Oh, we have men walking down the road. You do it with this kit. And I, I picked up a wonderful story, which I put on my blog, where a Canadian driver, because the Canadians have got them, the Americans have got them. These things, the, 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 the tilted things you see, open out flat wings. And they're ground detecting radar. They're also mine detectors, high tech kit. And I did a wonderful story about a Canadian being hit by him. And they got over the radio this blood-curdling scream as a bomb blew his machine apart. And as the dust, dust settled, they heard this little lamenting cry saying, I spilt me water bottle. <laughs> and that was a total sole extent of the damage. The kit is absolutely wonderful. Now, guess who ever had them first? The British. We bought them in 96. We use them in Bosnia to great effect, which is why the Canadians and the uh, Americans started using them, because we saw we, what did we do with them? We gave them away. Have we got them now? No, and we've no intention of buying them. Next one, now, the armored Humvee, big mistake. The US Marine Corps said, hey, this is killing people, look at our stuff, and that's why Robert Gates started buying the, the MRAPs. But what I want to point to is that bit in the front. Can you see the black thing? Believe it or not, it's called a rhino. Now, very simple countermeasure for heat-triggered bombs, because these were passive infrared. That is a diesel plug hooked to the electrical system to heat up the box, so you have now a heated box in front of you. And as you drive along, that triggers the bomb, and of course it misses. That was Rhino Mark I. They then offset the bomb so that it still hit the vehicle, so they then put it on an extendable arm so that the terrorists could never work out quite how far in front it was and never hit the vehicle. It saved a lot of lives, didn't save them all. But of course, we couldn't use it. Why not? Because the electrical system of the Land Rover couldn't cope. So much so that if they switched on the radio and the uh, electronic countermeasures, which didn't work anyway, they had to switch off the air conditioning. Our vehicles were that at the edge. So there was that one. We ended up with this. Now, this was the big joke joke in an ironic sense. We said you need protected vehicles. They said mobility, absolutely important. You cannot, we must have the Land Rovers for mobility. Four tons. We wanted the RG31 
seven tons. So eventually they roll over in August and they buy these beautiful vehicles. Not one person killed it. And one of them took six stack mines. That's nearly 40 kilo of TNT. And they walked away from it. They had it back in action in about six to eight hours. But the point was that after the ministry telling us that we couldn't have protected vehicles because we must have the Land Rover, what do they do? They buy one four foot longer than the RG31 at 23 tons. And then where wrong? After all that time, it just didn't pay out. Now, other things. Now, here we come into the uh, indirect fire. And I'll speed up. Sorry, Bill. <clears throat> this we did have. Mamba. Counter mortar radar. Absolutely essential. Fire a mortar. It's that good. It can pick up the bomb. It'll tell you where it's going to land. And what's more, before it's even landed, it'll tell you where it was fired. Now, what do you do then? We sent Land Rovers out to go and chase them. I actually measured the time on a terrorist video because they love videoing their things. White van comes, 82 mil mortar comes out, six bombs, 44 seconds back in the white van. And we're sending Land Rovers out from Abu G to chase them. Surprisingly enough, they got nowhere. We had the Mamba, but what we didn't have were these. Not until too late. And these are the UCAVs with the Hellfire. What you do with the terrorists is buy one, get one free. 20 pounds explosive on the, the warhead. And hey, presto, they're suddenly meeting their virgins. And highly effective it was. We were sending 300 troops out in armored sweeps to try and chase down fly-by-night mortar men when the Americans were taking them out with these. We also had these, or the Americans had these, which they, they would shadow. They would pick them up with the UAV vectored in by, by, by the counter mortar radar, and then they would just follow them. The last lot, I saw a wonderful video from Michael Yom, where the terrorists suddenly saw they were being shadowed and actually gave themselves up at the local police station. We had Lynx helicopters, fantastic helicopters, minor problem, they couldn't fly in the temperature. But apart from that, they were absolutely brilliant. Uh, plus, we only had six. But we did, in other words, we didn't have any helicopters when we damn well should have. Now, the other thing is quite interesting. What we were using throughout Aden, throughout Cyprus, and other counterinsurgencies was light aviation. Now, it's just a point I want to make and perhaps explore, is this mantra of underfunding. Now, this is Iraqi Air Force. It's a light aircraft. It has a high-performance, real-time video camera that can actually spot a man carrying a bomb at something like three miles. But the point I want to make is it has exactly the same equipment, no difference, as a Nimrod, which we were using in theater. So we were sending maritime reconnaissance aircraft into Iraq to take real-time video pictures and beam them down when the Iraqis were using this, which we'd actually bought, or the Americans bought. Now, the point I want to make about under-resourcing is that thing costs 330000 complete with kit, radio, the lot. A Nimrod costs 30,000 pounds an hour to fly for the same equipment. One 12 hour sortie, you could have bought one of those. And this goes on and on and on and on, and perhaps we can explore it, because actually, we seem to have a genius for doing things very badly at about 10 times the price of anybody else. Now, the other thing that has proved enormously successful is not only UAVs and cameras, but also what's called a network of raid masks. The Americans have put 300 of these up. It's got a 20-kilometer range where it can actually see a vehicle 20 kilometers. It can dominate an environment. And what's more, it's rigged to your counter-battery mortar. It can rig to an RWS, a machine gun, or it can rig to your counter-battery. Anything that happens in your immediate environment. Now, why do we lose people at Sangin? Walking on a routine patrol, why wasn't that under constant CCTV surveillance? Because the kit is there, and it works, and it's available. It was used in Northern Ireland. We pioneered it. Have we got any? No, the Canadians have. The Americans have. Have we? No, absolutely not. The other thing we had, or didn't have, which the Americans developed, is CRAM. Now, these are phalanx, uh, high-performance ship protection weapons. But they suddenly realized you can actually shoot down water bombs. The Americans had them up and working in 2003. I start, we actually asked again a parliamentary question in 2005, why don't we get them? We have assessed them, we don't find them value. 
after they walked out of um, Abu Naji, a year later, suddenly a UOR and they buy CRAM for, 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 for the COP. They could have had them two years earlier and that would have been another layer of protection. And one of the war winners, this on one particular raid in Alamara, an American Chai AC-130 Spectre, it's a war winner. I spoke a long time to one of the pilots when they started flying these out on the ranges in Arizona. They, were pick it, they, they used to line old cars up on the range and they'd pick cars and shoot them up. 20 mil, they have 40 mil, and they have the 105. And he says they got that good that they weren't just picking the car, they were telling you which window they would put the shots in. They were good. Now, whenever they were used, they were decisive. But there were so few in theatre, and they were an American asset, they were never available to us when we needed them. Now, they cost the same as a Eurofighter. Although the US Marine Corps are doing a nice one with a package unit where you can actually plug in the bits into an ordinary Charlie 130, but we can't do that because we haven't got any, because we're buying the uh, A400M, which isn't going to be with us for another few years. But overall, what turned the tide in a moral sense, if you, if you like a morale sense more than a moral, moral sense as well, was Robert Gates' decision to inject 10 billion funding into re-equipping the US Army and the US Marines, 10 billion on new ground equipment in order to ma uh, maximize force protection. As these machines, and this is just one consignment, and there's more there than we bought, and that's just one consignment, they reduced the casualty rate from IEDs by 80%. At the same time, ours was going up when we were saying there's nothing we can do about it. So basically, at the heart of it, my thesis or part of it was equipment failure, and I know I've taken more than 10 minutes, so sorry, let's go. A lot of that, including that last slide, is very familiar to those of us who've been uh, in Iraq. I was there um, very recently. In fact, I, I'm not sure where that last slide was, was taken, but we were shown the new um, American base with the new kit and it was absolutely startling to any of us who had been in Iraq before because there were the British Challenger tanks leaving, tanks that had not basically been used for years um, and snatch Land Rovers still parked here and there and there were MRAPs, uh, mine resistant and um, ambush protected, um, ambush protected uh, hundreds of them uh, and I think it was a statistic that they ordered um, the US Department of Procurement in the Defense Department ordered something like a thousand of them and they were ready in a year. Yes. I'm not quite sure why our Ministry of Defense does not manage to do that kind of procurement, but there we go. Can I just, mention just one point, yep. Bill? The, yep. your, your point about the challenges. When they did the first tranche of analysis on protection afforded by these MRAPs, uh, statistically, and actually some of the vehicles they bought were not actually very good, the Max Pros and a uh, bit iffy, but never mind. They, they took a broad range analysis on casualty rates across the field of different equipment. And they found you had a three times better chance of walking out of an MRAP without injury than walking out of a main battle tank at three times a weight. And what the MOD were telling me was, oh, these bombs were worse. Tank will not stop these bombs. Therefore, nothing in between or nothing lighter will stop them. Whereas, in fact, it was quite the reverse. Things of seven tons weight were taking anti-tank mines because they were designed to deal with them, whereas a tank obviously couldn't. And they did lose tanks. They lost two challenges, to my certain knowledge. You might know more. They didn't lose any massive. Well, actually, they lost one, but it caught fire. And nobody was hurt. Now, I would like to come to Deborah and Ken, yeah. but just very, very briefly, we want our, Britain wants to remain a, a military power. We have Trident, we have aircraft carriers, we want a couple more, we want fighter jets, we want tanks, uh, and we want all this stuff. Do we just want too much? Do, do we not need <coughs> to concentrate on the wars that we are fighting, or to what extent do we actually need to look ahead 20 or 30 years into the wars that we might fight? Well, and clearly you're saying the ministry is to blame and they're, you know, a bunch of idiots. Bill, the, 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 what, what I, I wrote about, I, I mentioned this point about underfunding. Now, this accursed links that doesn't work in the high temperature, 
So they fly it on the evenings and nights, or when it did fly during the mornings, it could fly with the mornings, but it's an eight-seater, it should be able to take eight passengers. The maximum can take is four. So one in Alamara had to pick up a casualty, they had to leave one man behind. It's that bad. Now the point about this is we put in a whole pile of parliamentary questions on costings for running equipment. The Lynx costs £23,000 per hour to operate. Now, the hot and high problem with the Lynx is well known to the Army. We have two detachments out in hot and high, one at Brunei, one in Belize. The Lynxes would not work there, and that was, this was 1993, Bill. The Lynxes would not work there, so they hired Vietnam Vintage, actually an enhancement on that, Bell 212s, on contract lease operated by Army Corps pilots, which could carry more, could operate hot and high. They cost on contract to the MOD £2,000 an hour. Now, again and again, we're seeing this. This whole nonsense, and I, I say it advisedly about helicopters. In 2003, the, sorry, 2006, the MOD was offered a batch of MI8 MTVs, the so-called MI17 um, uh, Russian helicopter. Same basic performance spectrum as a Merlin. Now, they were offered these either brand new or on contract hire with ex-Special Forces pilots or qualified instructors for 3000 an hour. Instead, they chose Merlins. Now, the, uh, the HC-3, we got a price for, was 32000 They paid $19 million for them. They could have had brand new uh, Mill uh, eights for something like three and a half, four million. Now then, instead of buying these, or at least so they told us, they went and bought the Danish Merlins, but they also had a deal with the Danish Merlins. Those things cost 29 million pounds each. 185 million they paid for six helicopters when they could have had them for six million. Now at the same time, we were telling them they could buy Bell 412s, which, are, which the Canadians, and the Canadians had the same problem. What did they do? They went out and bought Bell, Bell 412s and also hired a a a MI7s. Now, they were saying, they were telling us publicly, oh, no, we can't use Mill 7s. Meanwhile, we, they'd already bought six for special forces, and they still operate them. They lost one, but they're operating five very successfully to support special forces. But oh, no, when it came publicly to the helicopters, they, needed, they had to be Merlins at 29 million. And we've done so many exercises, a lot of this is written in the book, about the MOD, if I may be absolutely blunt, if not rather crude, there is not an underfunding issue here. The, I, I, I was invited to the MOD, and I, and I met Des Brown there, and I don't know if you, any of you have been into the atrium in the MOD, but it's got this glazed brick. It looks just like a public lavatory. And I wrote in the book, it's very appropriate considering what they're doing with our money, pissing it down the bloody drain. Now, if you think about except this... Except on their own building. Except on their own building. That's you think about this. This year, the Treasury Reserve... So this is not core budget. The Treasury Reserve payment to the force in Helmand, well, the force in Afghanistan, is three and a half billion. Now, do a simple little bit of arithmetic. Take three and a half billion and divide 9,000, the number of troops we've got. That comes to 400,000 per man. Now, you work out on a very generous ratio of one man effective with two men support. It's actually worse than that. But that means a teenager with a bayonet plodding down the, 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 the road in Hellman is costing you 1.2 million pounds a person. This has to be the most expensive deployment in the history of in, in military in the history of mankind. They are pouring money at this, and what are they getting for it? Absolutely nothing. Now we saw a company sweep. These men, those teenage soldiers, are costing just basic without the add-on thousand pounds a day. 
So that means a company suite, you're starting off with 100,000. The javelins, are you, are, do you know how much these anti-tank weapons cost that they're using for blowing holes in compounds? 70,000 each. They even use them for denial purposes. They had a Land Rover blown up by a mine and used a javelin to destroy it. 70,000 quid to destroy a burning Land Rover. Do you know, you see the pictures of the bombs. Do you know how much a GBU-38 costs? It's 100,000 quid. Do you know how much it costs to run a Harrier? Now, if you want to run an F-16, it takes 15 man hours maintenance per hour flow. If you want a Harrier, it takes 60 man hours, which is why a Harrier costs you 32,000 pounds an hour. Now, you take a company sweep, use a bit of ordnance, have one contact, call in an airstrike, a day's outing in sunny Helmand has cost us a million quid. What, to kill a couple of Taliban? No, I'm sorry, it isn't working. Richard, I'm going to so, pause you there, indeed. not stop you there, because right. I think that would be impossible. <laughs> um, and I'm going to go to our two other panellists and maybe start with um, Kim. Difficult to know what to pick up from there. But does that sound familiar to you? Is, is some of the... the both the pictures that we've seen and what Richard has said sound familiar to you. Well, Richard's absolutely right. The, the procurement system uh, is a mess, and it's um, become such a mess over such a long time, it's almost impossible to, to stop it now. You, you, you have to you know, scrap it all together and start again. Which is the reason we're seeing that, you know, they've spent so much money from, from contingencies, from what they call the Treasury urgent reserve. operational requirements on, on buying off-the-shelf um, um, armored vehicles. Most of it um, will be abandoned at some stage um, because they'll get out of date. And as we see the Vikings, they're not providing the protection that um, is required. So I think Richard's absolutely right about um, the, 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 the shortcomings in uh, equipment in Iraq. However, but what I do take issue is that um, the Iraq war, in my view, wasn't lost because of lack of equipment. If it was lost by the British, it was a combination of, of arrogance, lack of local knowledge, uh, sheer uh, paucity of intelligence, and the continuous mantra, we have been in Northern Ireland, so I know what you're doing, which the Americans got very fed up with, quite understandably, after a while. And, and, and frankly, at the end of the day, there wasn't the, the, the willingness to be in Iraq. I remember speaking to British soldiers. Uh, before the, the invasion, when I was in Baghdad, coming back and talking to them, um, meeting them during the war, uh, when we were in Baghdad, when they come up with the Americans, and then seeing them afterwards in Basra. Um, first of all, uh, I mean, I see my friend Caroline there, and, and then she was there to some of the worst times in, in Baghdad, when there used to be 100, 200 attacks a day. And, and what was happening in Basra was nothing compared to what we experienced in, 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 in Baghdad. Waves of suicide bombers mm. coming out of Fallujah to, to hit Baghdad and other cities. Um, and, and the British in the south built up a rather strange mixture of complacency and arrogance. You know, because they weren't um, getting hit so much, uh, they thought they were doing it right. Arrogance, again, because they thought they knew country insurgency. So um, it's just you know, cutting this long um, rambling uh, response short. Um, I certainly agree with Richard that um, the equipment failure played a part in the, the British, I would say it, it is entirely a defeat, but certainly British lack of success in, in Basra. But I would say in the great scheme of things it was a, a part, uh, maybe a large part, but the reason that Britain did not do well in Basra was because it was the wrong war to fight, the will wasn't there to fight it, uh, and they didn't want to be there in the first place. I remember c coming from Northern Ireland being astonished at how often people would repeat yes. that in Northern Ireland we won hearts and minds, we will do so in Southern Iraq. To my mind, as someone from Belfast, I don't remember a single heart and mind that was won by the British <laughs> Army in the Troubles there, so I failed to see how that could be applied uh, to the tribes um, of southern Iraq. Can I, can I say something yeah. here, Bill? I just want to come in. Oh, Deborah, go, did, did you? Let, let me just take yes, of course. Deborah, Deborah, first of all. I mean, you're not a <laughs> procurement um, expert, but you are a defence correspondent, and obviously equipment and you were there. is at the very heart of the story in Afghanistan right now, whether it's um, 
We saw just uh, a couple of weeks ago, indeed on ITV News, the, the, the um, bomb disposal expert whose body was flown home yesterday, advancing, as you said, with his mine detecting piece of equipment and was blown up just a couple of weeks later. We know the issue about helicopters, which some are now telling us is a dead argument because the Americans are there with their helicopters. I mean, how difficult is it for you to write about equipment? How interested really are people in bits of gear? Um, Toys. Toy. I mean, it, 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 it's quite it's difficult, isn't it? difficult to write about that kind of it's detail. It's always sexy, is it? Yeah, that's yeah. trouble. That's trouble. It, it, kind of, it, ta it takes an issue like the Snatch Land Rover yes. to get anyone interested. I mean, as soon as you're having a case of soldiers dying, then suddenly it's an issue. Yep. But in order to get to that point, the sort of behind the scenes, you know, equipment itself is not yep. an interesting. And is that because the Snatch Land Rover issue seemed like a no-brainer? How can you have something unarmored like this and so many soldiers dying in it? I mean, is that it's just an it, it's. Forgive me, but it's an easy issue to grasp hold of for the for the public and for ourselves. I guess there is that. I mean, you, and you also saw it in the Americans. I mean, the Amer you, t you were talking about how the Americans have this great um, uh, procurement scheme, which is mm. true, but they equally had their problems, and they were supposed oh, to Oh, they did. I they mean, they it had, you took had, like, them ten the, years. The Humvees sort of driving around with the. I mean, I've been in Iraq since mm. '04, and they had, you know, sort of soldiers using their armour. Uh, to sort of protect them. And I remember driving around as late as 2007, driving around um, uh, sort of a, a place called uh, well, Dora. It's in Baghdad. It was really dangerous. At the, well, yeah, it's kind of a hospital, wasn't it? Uh, and, and I remember being really scared. I was sitting in a Humvee, and, um, uh, and, and the, the soldiers could see that I was a bit nervous. And uh, they told me that not to worry, if we hit anything, then the driver would die. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the commander of the vehicle um, would, 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 would also be very badly, and probably die. The gunner would lose his legs, and I'd only get 30 percent burns. Reassuring. <laughs> Which was and, and, then, and, and then to add to that, I mean, you talked about the rhino, how the rhino yes. uh, detects sort of bombs and stuff. Um, the Americans. Uh, actually uh, had these obviously they have these rhinos but the problem was it is very hot and they can't run the air conditioning and the rhino as well so they used to sort of turn off the rhino and keep the air con right. so that was good and, and, and another thing about the Humvees is, is that you know you talked about the MRAPs and the massive procurement of MRAPs and how that's really great <coughs> a lot of soldiers actually say they prefer Humvees because MRAPs break down all the time I remember being stuck in the middle of Sada City in a MRAP that like the suspension had gone bust and we were just like sitting ducks. So there yes. are problems. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But, but the Americans who I think um, people in the British Army took rather a, um, what's a charitable word, snooty view yes. of at the beginning that they were doing everything wrong. The Americans seemed to learn yes. quite quickly and are doing quite a lot right now. Briefly, what, if, that, if that's true, yeah. why is that? Why is mm. our Ministry of Defense difficult to turn and inflexible and it seems the Americans who maybe three or four years ago took a long hard look at how wars were going and decided they'd made lots of mistakes and now appear to be doing many things right. What, 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 how, how are they able to be more flexible? Kim talked very rightly and I, I totally agree with what Kim was saying. Um, I'm answering the question. Um, the equipment was one small part of it. I just chose to focus on that one. Kim mentioned arrogance, and it's there in spades. The biggest fight I had over the snatch was with the army. And one of the, the, the misperceptions about the snatch debate was that it was the army that wanted them, and it was the mean politicians wouldn't pay for them. It was the other way around. The politicians were trying to, were imploring the army to take him on board. The generals don't have to stand up in parliament and give the speech about the, the poor dead soldiers. It's the politicians. They hate it. But the army didn't want it. The army had its own agenda and didn't want to siphon off their money from their new toys. They have <coughs> their own vision of what war should be. They're absolutely besotted with the idea of war and maneuver. That's what they teach them in Sandhurst. 
They're absolutely besotted with this idea of rapid reaction forces, air mobile forces, eight-wheeler piranhas. And they don't regard counterinsurgency as a real war. It's sort of that nasty, messy thing around the corner. And they don't like MRAPs because they're not proper armoured vehicles. They're just trucks on wheels. Um, it seems to me that there's a, uh, if you like, a cultural difference also. That it, and this is to do with the British, not just the army. Is here, uh, failure is a big deal. So we go out of our, because the media leaps on failure. They love failure, uh, blame the blame game, minister did this, blah, 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 blah. In America, failure is not a big deal. They ride with it, they learn from it, and they exploit it. Whereas here, because there is such a penalty on failure, we tend to pretend that we haven't failed, we tend to hide failure and we try to pretend that everything was actually all right and that's how we planned it in the first place. So I think there's a key cultural issue here. And it's part to do with the media, it's also part here in our psyche. And the army is the worst progenitor of this because they just simply will not admit they're wrong about anything. I think you must have found this. Yeah, kind of, I was going to say, I mean, one of the things following on from what Kim said, um, <coughs> is that the big tragedy of our failure you know, inability to get as much success as we wanted in Iraq is the fact that the, the government and the military don't they don't acknowledge it. It's crazy. Yeah. It's like you know, it's like this big elephant in the room, and they just don't acknowledge it. I was there in March, <coughs> and um, I, I remember writing this sort of article. You know, six years, the legacy. Blah, yeah, blah, I remember blah. reading it. Yes. And, um, and 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 I was actually I wasn't really embedded with the with the British. I was I was sort of on this little camp on the base. And the, the next morning when the article was published, I got this phone call from the, uh, the press officer for the general, the two-star general down there, saying that uh, he wanted to have a meeting with a coffee. And apparently a meeting with a coffee is better than without a coffee. Um, and, and I remember going, yeah, I had no real choice, and going in there and sitting with um, General Andy Salmon. And um, he sort of sat across the table from me and, and just looked me in the eye and was like, you know, if you just view this whole campaign with a cup half empty attitude. Um, and just sort of went through my article and saying, saying that I just failed to see the success that they'd, they'd, achieved, they'd had. And it was crazy. I mean, he was, he was really sort of like um, touching on this bridge they were going to build across the Shat al Arab, like a sort of, what are they called? Like a drawbridge thing. Cantilever. Yeah, that goes up yeah. and down. Yeah. And um, I mean, the very fact, the fact of this bridge, which is, he was saying is, you know, it's a great legacy. It was thought up by an American naval captain, um, and it's being paid for by the Iraqis and the Americans. I mean, he was just kind of there steering the idea uh, after it had been already conceived, which kind of means, you, you know, you, the, the public, um, you know, we're, we're being told how Iraq was a great success, you know, our boys did good. Um, whereas actually, it's, it just isn't isn't the case. So we're not learning the lessons, like you said, which means again we could have the same thing happening in Afghanistan. Yeah, the sense of um, you know, there's an astonishing sense of, of denial. I mean, the the uh, it, it reached sort of farcical proportions. There, there was a time when when uh, when the, the the rifles were four rifles were in in um, in Basra Palace in Saddam's old palace, and they were getting shelled, rocketed every single day, every single supply run. Was absolutely hair raising because I, I went on a couple of them and, and uh, you know, I can't recall being um, being so so scared for a very long time. Now I just happened to be there and 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 um, and I was one of the few journalists who got there very very late. And the reason we got there very very late was because not so much the MOD actually this time, Richard. It was the FCO on Downing Street oh, right. who wanted to pretend that Basra was you know, sweetness and light. You know, they're, they're preparing to pull out of, of, of Basra Palace, uh, the deal they had done uh, with the Shia militias. Uh, they would leave Basra Palace and then hunker down at the, at the airport. And they pretended, or they tried to pretend, that they're leaving Basra a, a, a peaceful place. Now, the first question that, that the Patrick Sanders guys from Four Rifles asked was, you know, why is it that you guys have been writing endlessly about Helmand, which we have been, because that was a new war. That's where we have been, rather than Iraq. And, and what's been going on here to us has not been reported. And the reason it wasn't reported was because uh, the, the government, in this case led by the FCO and Downing Street, basically tried their best to prevent access by the British media, or any media for that matter, 
to, to, to go into Basra at the time to, to see that, that you know, Basra Palace was a miniature Dien Bien Phu getting hit every single day. Um, I just want one very quick point, which is that if the whole question of counterinsurgency, now whether we like it or not, um, we'll have to, not we personally, but the, the, the troops certainly in, in Afghanistan now, will have to depend less on equipment. And if you look at the, the, the Petraeus plan, the, the Kilcullen plan, and, and, and the one that General McChrystal, who's now the, the, the NATO commander in Afghanistan, is, is working out, is, is basically you know, the, the very simple matter of having boots on the ground. You know, not just taking a place and withdrawing and, and then calling in airstrikes. You know, it's a question of you know, going there and staying there, which is going to be much more risky. Uh, invariably, there'll be more casualties, more fatalities. Um, and, and the whole idea about, as Kilcullen was explaining the other day, you know, it was, it was basically, you know, the, the whole question of civilian casualties is, is so important in Afghan minds yes. at the moment. And the more airstrikes you have, the more chance of them happening. It's not done out of malice, it's, it's done out of mistakes. And thus, if you stop doing that, if, if, if you stop using airstrike that much more, then you're going to use, have to have more boots on the ground. And that means that troops will have to take more risk that means they'll be on the ground and they'll be much more vulnerable. I'd quite like to throw it open to the floor because there is such a lot to talk about, not just about Iraq and what you've been listening to, but of course the lessons that we may or may not learn in Helmand right now. So if you would like to um, begin, there is a microphone, uh, which um, and the gentleman in the second row, I think, and then, sir, you in the front row. I think my favourite bit. Uh, yes. Multi. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yep. Uh, so Jock Stirrup described Iraq as a noble endeavour. I don't know whether any, any of you have heard or seen the uh, speech that Dr. Omar al Kubesi gave to the European Parliament on the 28th of March of this year, where he described the conditions in Iraq. It is 23 pages long. I'm obviously not going to read it. I would just like to read the last points. It has the highest rate of infant and newborn fatality in the world. In Iraq, after the occupation, more than 5 million are displaced. More than 4 million are below poverty level. Approximately 2 million widows, 5 million orphans, insufficient food for more than 8 million, more than 400,000 have been detained and imprisoned and tortured, I should add, and more than 28% of the population is unemployed. In the first six weeks of the war, 200,000, no, I beg your pardon, 20,000 cruise missiles were fired into Iraq. In the first day of the war, 387 cruise missiles were fired into Iraq and 30,000 bombs were dropped on it. This is after three years of it being bombed to pieces in the no-fly zones by the US and the UK. In the light of all this, do you consider that Sir Jock Stirrup's remark of it being a noble endeavor is accurate? Thank you. Richard, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but far away. Well, I, I, I think there is... An oh, and I haven't got rounds of depleted uranium. Yeah, sure. But I, 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 I think to marshal this and to be very brutal with you, we have to split the two issues of the invasion and the occupation. Now, the invasion was one thing, and that is an issue, and it, it's not one... I, I can or will entertain within the context of this, particularly because as of the 1st of May 2003, our legal status actually changed in that we became, alongside the Americans and only with the Americans, an occupying power. And that immediately brought in legal obligations under the Hague regulations and under the Geneva Conventions. All of which we've ignored. Which included that, that, that is true. a duty of care. It, indeed it was. And, and now, what I am concerned about, which is why I won't entertain your point, is because what you're dealing with is a very important and very serious issue. But what I am concerned about is that it is shrouding 
and if you like, blotting out the separate and different issue of the occupation, which was a different episode, its own failure, and for different reasons and different dynamics. So I take what you say, I hear what you say, but I, I think we also must focus and separate out these two issues and look very carefully at the occupation and try, please, not to confuse the issues. There are obviously parallels, but we are talking about two entirely different legal entities and different episodes in history. And <coughs> that is my concern. Gentlemen in the front row, could I also ask you just to identify yourselves as you ask your question? Sir. Uh, my, name's, my name's Alan Barty. Um, Richard, you've made an excellent uh, case as regards the procurement deficiencies. But is that the real problem? <coughs> it, it, it does seem to me that the, the problem is that you've got a coalition or had a coalition in Iraq. So you had essentially two armies who had different objectives, yes. different attitudes to fighting the war, different attitudes to each other. The, the Brits thought the Americans were a bunch of cowboys. The Americans thought the Brits were a bit feeble and weren't really yes. up to the job. It, as long as you have a war with a coalition, you're always going to have that sort of problem. The Brits should not have gone into Iraq if they did not share exactly the same objectives yeah. and, and exactly the, the, the same way of dealing with the problem. Well, interestingly, um, I, I think it's fair to say that initially the British were actually better, albeit that they, didn't, they weren't launched immediately into the big Sunni insurgency, which was actually... Uh, I mean, Steele's very good about this. So basically, we, the, the Americans created the, the insurgency, in a sense, up north. And yes, we were better. But let me make two points. First is that we were selling the Americans the idea of we were better because we, we, we understood counterinsurgency because of Northern Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. What screams at me from the whole of the occupation experience is that although we were selling the idea of Northern Ireland experience, we weren't actually employing it ourselves. The, one of the fundamental tenets established in Northern Ireland is you must not allow safe havens for terrorists. And that is, of course, uh, what Operation Motorman was in, in 1972, where the IRA had set up no-go areas in London Derry and in Belfast, and we put in 22,000 troops to say, no, there are no-go areas, no no-go no areas. So what did we do? We created or allowed the Mahdi to turn Al Amara, a city, a whole city, into a no-go area and walked away from it. Now, the, at the point, there was a difference in doctrine. <laughs> A lot of our, our doctrinal thinking was right if we'd actually cared to implement it. And the Americans were prepared to learn from this. Now you're going to get these differences. Now, if the dynamic works properly, then you learn if he, off each other. You bounce off each other. What somebody tries in one area may or may not work in another area. So it's not a bad thing to have doctrinal changes and doctrinal differences, difference of approaches. But the problem is that the Americans went in with no doctrine. They didn't have a doctrine manual. It was Petraeus wrote it for them two years later. They then implemented it. We had a doctrine manual that was years old. And you talk about Jock Stirrup. He was on, I actually managed to get it into the book, uh, interviewed for The Economist, saying they still hadn't revised their doctrine manual. And hey, they've been fighting two counterinsurgencies, and they still now haven't got an up-to-date doctrine manual. There's your, there's your problem. Uh, yeah, now, the final point for me. Equipment is an enabler, but I also have a theory about equipment. Military equipment is the ultimate in functionalism. It's there to do a job. Now, you can talk to the generals, and you can have, and I've been criticised for not talking to the generals. I judge people by what they do. But the point is that because equipment is so functional, it betrays the mindset that designed it and bought it. So that if you want to mirror into the soul of an army and want to work out how it fights, what it intends to do, look at its equipment. Not just as the toys, Debbie, 
but at the thinking and the rationale, the mindset behind it. So when I saw the Land Rovers, the Snatches, go into uh, Basra, that wasn't just Snatches going into land. In, 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 that was a primary, a light patrol vehicle. It was actually designed for the country roads and all that. It wasn't a riot control vehicle, but they used it for riot control. But the moment they put that in and maintained it in position, it told you they were thinking public order. So you didn't have to ask the generals. You watched what equipment they were using, and you watched the way they were using it, which actually told you what they were really thinking. Perhaps an army fighting the last war rather than the war that they were in at the minute. Can I just move on to this gentleman in the second row, and then we'll come to you, sir, with the glasses. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes uh, Bill, uh, the, uh, Iraq is not a forgotten war, certainly not for me, for my family, or my relatives. So please, please try not to use such an emotive phrases, yes? I, I, I wasn't saying that it was truly forgotten. Right. I was just We are still suffering the conflict. consequence of what you, all of you, as reporters, have gone in there, have a free day, free, uh, be, uh, you know, reported in Iraq, never ventured out of the hotel, then wrote anything and everything about Iraq. Uh, first of all, I start with uh, Richard. Richard, have you been to Iraq before 2003? No. No, why not? I am a parliamentary researcher. You're a parliamentary researcher. No. And you have spent the whole evening waxing, <coughs> waxing lyrical about the killing machinery of, of what it can do and what it can't do. Have you ever considered what those machines can do to humans, men and women? I come from Basra, so you talk about Basra, and you, none of you know nothing about Basra. You talk about Iraq, uh, the Basra base, it's an <coughs> air base. It's, it used to be Basra Airport. So why you keep on persisting in this lie of calling air base? It's a Basra Airport. And you talk about Basra base, Kim mentioned Saddam Palace. It was a reception palace. So uh, obviously, it's an emotive word to mention <coughs> Saddam. Saddam is the cause of all evil, cause of your headache, his <coughs> stomach headache, everybody's headaches. Okay. Uh, right. May I please take take you through through some of the points you 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 said you mentioned. If I may, I have to yes, turn. Please, please. Just, just please. as you turn your notes, could you just introduce yourself? Sorry, yes. tell us. My name, my name is George Davis. Yes. I'm an Iraqi, a Christian Iraqi. Yes. yes. Uh, I live, I live in, in this country. I originally came here to study, right? Thank you. And, uh, and it's not because of Saddam, I haven't gone back. I used to go back every year visit my family, even visit the graves of my parents. Now, I don't even have that opportunity to go and pay my respect to the graves of my mother and my father, thanks to the British government and thanks to people like yourselves who sit down here and glibly write about Iraq as if it's just another piece of, uh, of uh, journalism. Uh, it, uh, If I may, please, uh, I'm, I'm going to flip through. Uh, you, we, we, we do, uh, Richard, you mentioned, do, do the job. What job is that? Killing people? Uh, held, uh, held our head high. Then uh, liberated, the Sh uh, liberated Shia, democratic Iraq. What democratic Iraq are you talking about? No, There's no, no democracy in Iraq. Look, Contrary I, to what anybody tells us, Country, I'm telling you now, there is no democracy in Iraq. The women are in shackles. The, no, no, no woman is allowed to go out in the street. She, she'll be thrown, uh, acid thrown over her face. And, and, and you don't write about that. For God's sake, why don't you write what's happened? When you went to Basra, why did you not write as to what happening, what happening to the women in, in Basra? You talk about you went to Amara. How far did you venture out in Amara? I Look, sir. So. Yeah, please. Um, you, you're attacking all of us. I mean, I'd like to say I spent three years in Iraq. You talk about how we, we spend our times in the hotels. Yes. I spend all my time. I used to wear brown contact lenses. I wore a hijab. I wore an abaya. Yes. I went to Basra. I spent. I spent Which part of Basra, please uh, enlighten me? It was a, it Enlighten was a, me. Which part of Basra? I come very, from Basra. Yeah, sure. It was a, I was staying in a family's house. Yes. Um, and it was about. A five ten minute drive from the main market area. Um, it was quite an affluent neighbourhood. It yeah. was pretty safe to stay there. And did you venture out in the streets? Of course, I ventured out. Did in you the venture out in the street yes. without the hijab? 
without a hijab, no. only in Baghdad. It's only in Baghdad. Place. Why is it? Because it was unsafe for you to do so. Obviously. Obvi you talk it was about not obviously. You, you said, you, said, you talk about. Uh, let me just. Uh, look, look, sir. You, you talk look. about with amusing tales, with anecdotes about you going in, in, a, in a tank in a Torah street. Is it? Which, please correct me. Sorry? Which part did you go in Baghdad? I in the tank? Adora. I mean, I was giving. Adora. My, I'm my, brother, my brother lives near, near, near Adora. Uh, I've been in Dora myself without a tank. Uh, I've, been, I've been, like I said, yes. I, I go dressed as an Iraqi, like, dressed as an Iraqi, so I say blend in. Because yes. obviously, and I don't actually want to Chatted, you actually chatted to Iraqis? Of course. Of course. What did they you speak Arabic? No, I have a translator. I, you, have uh, I see. So he can tell you whatever you want us to know. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's a very, very, he's completely on the side of the Iraqis. He's not um, some sort he's of. completely food. on the side of the Iraqis, but he had When's the last time you were in Iraq? Could, could, could I just say, sir, I, I absolutely respect your point of view and I understand your passion and your feeling. No, no, no. See, well, I, I'm coming I, back just I know, finally. I, I finally. Very, very, finally. very briefly, because I would like to. Richard, move on. you mentioned about the British arms. No one in the world buy British arms, with, with the exception of the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, because the Saudis and the Kuwaitis which, we don't know which end of the gun to hold. That's the only people who buy it from you, okay. from the British. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm sorry to slightly cut you off. La lady in the third row. Uh, thank you. Um, my name's Lara White. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the framing of the war as how it's been um, reported. It's this type of hyper-masculine, <coughs> soldiers on own story type uh, thing that we have, and in doing so, have we we haven't talked about the um, the countless thousands, and I was just wondering, do you feel that in doing so that you've actually made yourself slightly irrelevant? Because if people want to know about the countless thousands, they go to other organisations such as the Red Cross or um, Human uh, International Human Rights or to um, non-governmental organisations. Do you feel that um, online has taken this role because because of this and? Um, and how this gap of information has been filled in some way, and how do you feel that about how relevant you are now? It's, it's a good question because Richard has written in his book um, <laughs> uh, about the media and says the media has failed in its most fundamental task of reporting the news in Iraq. Its analysis was too often trivial or non-existent, and I can't remember the number of times that you say the media went to sleep 2007 the almost complete lack of reporting trivial superficiality etc 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 um your point and richards can, can i say bill yes uh, now this puts me in a privileged position because you're the provider the three of you here i'm the customer now in fact i'm more than a customer because I work for a number of MPs who take the idea of monitoring the army and monitoring the government very seriously, and they need information. You're the supplier of information. Now, when I had the task of constructing a narrative, just the framework narrative of what went on between May 2003 through to 2009, I was not able to rely on the British media to give me any structure or any framework or fill in the detail. Now, I picked from all of you. Some of you were very good on some aspects. Other aspects, I think, as I said, are trivial in, in, in certain respects. Uh, and I found the main support, and if you read the book, uh, where I quote many, many uh, media resources to illustrate and to analyze, my main information came from the Arab press, and a huge amount of information came from the insurgents themselves. Now, when the insurgents are telling the story better online than the British media, I think I am justified in saying that, that the job collectively was not done. Kim, Deborah, we, we failed. Well, it's certainly the case that uh, the reporting from uh, Iraq was uh, imperfect. The reporting <coughs> from Afghanistan at the moment is imperfect. Uh, in my limited experience, reporting from conflict zones are imperfect. You know, I've covered yeah. uh, about 15 wars. You know, uh, recently I've been to Somalia, I've been to Darfur, to Sri Lanka. In none of these places can we ever get the full picture. I cannot, you know, going to see 
a, a, a particular village which has been hit by the resistance struck insurgent or, 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 the, or the foreign forces ever get the full picture of what happened. All I can do is, 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 is deliver a snapshot. Um, that's what one can do, because you are, to a certain extent, a, a player yourself in this. It, it's very difficult not to be involved. Um, uh, this gentleman is right to a large extent, you know, that, that we don't venture out as much as we should do. I am quite lucky, you know, with my skin colour, if I dress in the local urban way, I can get away in, in places like Baghdad, which I used to do. Um, we, 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 it's not as if we are risk averse. We, we don't stay in the, the green zone in, in, in Baghdad. Uh, Deborah and I stayed in, in, in the Hamra, in Karada. Uh, we got blown up. I remember lying in bed, seeing my room fly around me. About 40 people died in that attack behind the hotel. It was um, a, been a pair of suicide bombers. So, <coughs> uh, so we are part of it, you know, whether we like it or not. Now, having said that, uh, I'd like to point out that so far in Iraq, 228 journalists have been killed, you know, compared to 45 in the Second World War, compared to 72 in the Vietnam War and compared to 50-something in the Balkans. And the vast majority of them have been Iraqi journalists uh, who take much more risk than we do and, and who are far braver uh, than, than we are as well. Having said that, I refuse to buy that uh, what we report is, is, is comparable in any way with something uh, an insurgent puts down on, online, which is not checked which would be propaganda. Just I wouldn't as, use just, it unless as, I did. Just Kim, as, uh, do me that just as anything that, you know, that, that is you know, put out purely uh, by the military, you, know, you cannot take without, yeah. without questioning. So yes, you know, the, 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 the reporting from Iraq has, been, uh, has not been comprehensive. In my view, uh, covering conflicts, it can never be. Uh, we, know we, we do, do make mistakes, but I think it'd be unfair to say that it's because of, 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 of lack of trying. Um, and, 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 and at the end of the day, the, the great danger of, of saying that all mainstream media is unreliable um, or, or simply don't provide the information is you, you go off to, on a, to, the, to the esoteric fringe media, which provides reporting which is very colorful and sometimes very, very wrong and sometimes dangerous, we say. Kim, uh, can I, to, to, can to, I to say to in his defense, very, very <laughs> I, I've made a lot of friends with a lot of correspondents and I work with journalists. And in fact, one of the greatest laments you'll probably agree with me on is that a lot of journalists produce a lot of good material that gets spiked so that you get stories which are generated. You can pick them up in the Washington Post, the New York Times, that they're not in the British press. The story about, yeah, I would not use material from the insurgents as I cross-checked it. Interestingly, when in Alamara the uh, insurgents took out a Challenger tank, it was reported the next day by the Arab media. It took three months for the British media. But it was there, but it wasn't used. And the thing is, the BBC, of course, has got a world class monitoring service. It knew what was going on because it has the daily transcripts. What the hell was going on there? Oh. <laughs> Deborah, sorry, I shouldn't have that's intervened. That's it right. was your turn. I'd I really like to respond because it's something I feel really passionately about. Um, and I do agree with what Kim said um, in, in the sense that um, it's impossible to cover a conflict um, ho wholly. Like I remember I was there in 2004 um, when the, uh, the, 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 the Sunni insurgency was really igniting and I remember being so frustrated I'd never covered conflict before unlike my wizened colleague next to me um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I just remember being really frustrated that you can't speak to the other side you know I don't want to be a one-sided reporter that just gets their sort of manuscripts from the the British and the Americans I wanted to speak to the other side and it was so difficult I mean, we had one person that we, we could rely on that could give us the insurgents take on things and, um, and, 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 and that was all we had and then after that you obviously had the fact that the, the journalists became the targets which made it so much more difficult for us to to do our jobs properly I mean you kind of scoffed at me um, in the sense when I said that I did go out but I had to wear an abaya um, a, a, a hijab and abaya that was because I don't want to become I don't want my mum to see me dressed up in an orange jumpsuit with you my head chopped off being shot up. 
Of course I mind that. But I was going to say I mean, to your question as well, the first gentleman who spoke out, you asked about the noble endeavour. I mean, I've, I've been asked lots of times, was it worth it? I unfortunately, I've also have never been in Iraq before 2003, no, so I've got no comparison to that. But all I can say is, is that nothing's worth all those lives that have been lost. And um, I mean, by the time it got to 2007, the Times, we were the one up for the Times, we were the only uh, newspaper with a permanent bureau in Baghdad. So you're right when you say that the coverage was patchy, but it wasn't out of a lack of effort. It was out of, uh, out of the inability for us to operate without spending enormous amounts of money um, to hole up in a, in a hotel. Uh, it just was really difficult. And, and just a small point about it. Do you have a twinge of conscience? Do you have a twinge of conscience? What is that? Of course I do. Country. I've got friends that do you have 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 died. a twinge of conscience? What you've done to my country? Well, uh, to, to, to be fair, I don't think report. r reporters have necessarily done, done things to your country. Uh, uh, sir, I'm aware that you put your hand up first, but we haven't had a single question from this side of the room, so I'm going to be partial and ask this. Oh, has he, I beg your pardon. That, as Ronald Reagan said, that, that's what matters. You pay for the microphone. You can have Thank it. Uh, John Strafford, um, could I move on uh, to Afghanistan? Yes. Um, uh, we have been fighting a war there now for eight years. I understand that the occupying forces only control about a fifth of the country. That means it'll be about another 30 years before we actually control the whole lot. And yet the people of Afghanistan, a majority, uh, and the majority of the British people, want all the troops to be pulled out. Isn't it time that the politicians listen to the people, or are we doomed to make the same mistakes in Afghanistan as have been made in Iraq? Mm, I think we are doomed certainly to make the same mistakes. What's probably even worse is we're doomed to make different mistakes as well. Um, recently we heard of the tragic death of Lieutenant Colonel Thornlow. Now, I've spent a lot of time and a lot of work on that on, on, and got a lot of details there. Now, I, the moment they put that vixen, uh, sorry, the, the vixen, the Viking theatre, I wrote several pieces about it saying it should never have been let there. Uh, it was very obviously ill-equipped to deal with the threat that was there then and subsequently. Now, the reason I am told from very reliable sources that it was being used, and it wasn't necessarily a good idea to have a helicopter in there. We saw that MI-26 shot down. The reason was, was that the heavier protected vehicles were too heavy for the bridges. So they had to use the lighter, better vehicle uh, with, with better cross country. Now, I wrote a piece which we actually did find the way in the Telegraph, but, but nowhere else. It cost 200,000 quid to build a bridge, a Bailey Bridge. Up the road, they spent 400,000 on a Ferris wheel and women's part that can't be used by women because they're not allowed out on their own, and a Ferris wheel that um, is for what? Yeah, the whole situation seems absolutely crazy. The road system, the, the Romans learned that government is about roads. The Chinese Empire learned it. We conquered the uh, Indian Empire by building railways. They opened up the, the, the Wild West by building, and we haven't got a road system. We've got a road system that's going back. How can you govern a country that hasn't got roads and we're spending money on Ferris wheels? And incidentally, we bought the kind <laughs> Uh, when you do this on a blog, you've got this strike mechanism where you can write something and strike it out and put the other word. Where we're buying farmers, uh, but before that I put Taliban, 5,000 tonnes of fertiliser this year. And guess what, at the time we started supplying farmers with fertiliser, they started making fertiliser bombs. Yeah, we're making every mistake and more. And Kim, I know, wants to come in, because yours is a broad point about lessons learned. I think it's a fairly typical Western conceit to to conflate Iraq and Afghanistan. They're not the same wars. Yeah, I agree. The, the dynamics are entirely different. In my experience, the attitude of the people in the countries are very, very different. Now, I did go to Iraq before the war. I used to go in the 90s. And a lot of people I knew in Iraq who actually welcomed, um, welcomed the invasion because they 
the heat of Saddam, uh, oh, tougher under Saddam. Oh, Can I finish? No, come on. Um, you know, they rapidly turned against the invasion because of the, the, the certainly in the first, you know, the, the, the 2000 and end of 2004, the, the actions of the, of, the, of, the, of the American troops. So even the people who, who did see as a necessary evil having foreign troops there turned against it very, very quickly. Now, in my experience in Afghanistan, um, that is not the case. Now, the Afghans, like any other country, do not want to have foreign troops in there but they don't want to have the Taliban back there either. Now, I, I found it, but tried very, very hard to find people who'd actually, actually support the Taliban. And apart from in, in the Pashtun belt, in Pilaspin Baldak, in, in, in some villages, uh, you know, the support for the Taliban isn't that great. I mean, if you, especially, if, I mean, you know, just, just think about what they did, just think about what they did to women. And what they're doing now, in, in 2005, I interviewed six women who were supposed to be part of this brave new Afghanistan. Of the six, five have now been murdered. The sixth woman, who is the female MP for Kandahar, uh, is in hiding in Kabul, in an ambush. Her husband was killed Kali and her daughter secure. was shot. A friend of mine, who was headmaster in Ghazni, uh, refused to shut down a, a female high school. They disemboweled him and left his body. So I think, you know, let's not romanticize the, you know, the Taliban too much. And I think, you know, in my experience, it is not the case that all Afghans want foreign forces to go straight away. They want foreign forces to go as soon as possible. But they also know that, you know, for the time being, it, it, it's an unfortunate presence which they are putting up with. Time for two more questions. I will finally take a question from this side. And uh, if there's anyone else. Thanks yes. very much. Sure. Um, Richard, uh, this uh, question actually comes in many parts and, and for the, the three of you. Um, Richard, you, uh, you mentioned earlier in your, in your talk that you didn't talk to generals, that you didn't feel the need to. Um, and you focused massively on the withdrawal from Alamara as, as a particular turning point in the war. Um, and I'm wondering, with some of the sweeping generalizations you seem to make, whether you actually talked to boots on the ground as well. Um, I think if you had have done, you'd have realized that actually the withdrawal from Alamara coincided with a point well beyond. We'd already lost political will within uh, back home. It were, we were, we were, we'd lost that uh, far earlier on. Um, <clears throat> however, given that, again, uh, the point that you've made there, sir, um, the people on the ground, particularly uh, before this point, although in, in the same manner they, uh, they didn't want us there, they realized the implications of when we do go, what could happen and that perhaps we uh, were leaving at, at too soon a time, having not done the job that, that we had set out to do. Given that then, um, and given that all three and, and pretty much everybody in here deems that, that the, uh, the occupation was not a success, um, and given the loss of political will and obviously the, the, the fact that we should try and draw some lessons from this, what lessons can we learn from it? What limited success was there within the Iraq war and in particular given our, our current uh, surroundings what lessons can the media in particular draw from uh, from the occupation just before Richard answers can I just ask did you serve in yes, Iraq yeah I did and very very briefly <laughs> do you consider that what you did was in any way a success how, how do you <coughs> look back on your time there um, I have very very mixed feelings about it um, I was involved uh, from the withdrawal from Amara, I served both in Amara, Alamara and uh, in Basra and around the country. Um, there's, uh, like I say, mixed feelings. I, I spoke to many Iraqis on the streets um, through interpreters and through uh, English-speaking Iraqis who, um, despite the fact that they didn't support the occupation, were very, very worried about when we left. Um, I don't think that we left Iraq in a better state. I think that uh, it will be a short amount of time before there is some sort of civil war uh, and before the Mali army decide actually they'd like a much larger role in politics. I don't think that there is democracy. I don't think anybody does. Um, however, I think that uh, with all noble intentions, um, the best job was done under the circumstances. And I think that the key factor was that we lost political will back here very, very early on. Thank you very much. Yeah, I did speak to a lot of people on the ground. Yes, I know, and I make a big point about the political will, but it wasn't only political will in the sense of the civilian politicians. It was also the army top brass. Now, 
what I I have broken new ground here. The decision. Sorry, go on. If you. Sorry, I, I just qualify political will. I, I don't know you mean politicians and jobs. I mean the, the masses, the people. Um, yeah, the that was part of it. Yeah, I, I agree. Of course, there's a closed loop. You know, everybody will back a winning side, and if you think that they're losing, and I think back here on the home front, we got the impression that it was drifting, it, uh, and that, of course, reinforces the view. Uh, if it had been seen as a, as a way out of success and everybody was singing and dancing, I'm sorry to parody it, then perhaps public sentiment would have been different. But the point is, uh, and this is, as I say, where I think I, I've made broken new ground uh, with some very, very high-level sources. Earlier on, uh, I, I think you'll agree, the British Army went in on the invasion with the elements of an army equipped for Northern European warfare. Now, at that time, we had General Jackson with a future army structure. We also had the future rapid effect system being considered with the lightweight, medium weight brigades, air portable. Now, in order for the army to have prevailed, given everything else, the incompetence, the arrogance, and all the other points you made, given everything else, in order to have achieved a success, the army needed fundamentally to re-equip to deal with the insurgency. And the equipment and structures of an army to cope with an insurgency are different from the equipment and structures you need to fight a conventional war, stopping the Soviets going through the full gap. Now, at a very high level, what happened and the decisions weren't made in Basra or they were made in London, were that the army was faced with a choice. It either continued its investment plans, high-level investment plans, for new equipment and new structures to cope with rapid reaction force, future rapid effect system, and all the kit that went with it. And that was a 16 billion price tag. Or it changed its plans midstream and re-equipped, restructured to deal with an insurgency. And at that very high level, a decision was made, wrongly I think, and that's my opinion, that the Iraqi campaign was a short-term campaign, was not worth the investment, was not worth changing the army or risking the army, and therefore Iraq was left to hang out to dry while they pursued their plans, these grand deliquent uh, plans, for buying all this shiny new kit to fight the future war. And it, it's a major theme, and I think that is why the army lost the war. And, and that will be a feature of the defence review that's still One hopes. next year. Yeah. Final question from the... Oh, so I beg your pardon, Deborah. Yeah. Yes. You, you asked what the lessons yes. could be yeah. learned. Is um, you've got to invest in, really a, in think, a war. I think that the, the, the main lesson to be learned from Iraq is just not to go to war in the first place based on dodgy intelligence <laughs> um, and, and, and also only do it when you have the full backing of the international community which we just didn't have and it all fell apart I mean, we, we started from wrong footing I think that's the main broad lesson and for the media uh, I think the main lesson for me personally and I'm not sure if Kim would agree um, is, is like to what I learned is that you know government just because it's a government doesn't mean it's telling the truth Oh, yeah, Debbie, yeah. Clearly a bit naive, yeah. honestly, yeah, I'm being honest. Um, and also um, to, to work, to try harder um, to get both sides of the story. I've said earlier it's really difficult, and it is no, difficult. Um, but but th that was the main lesson that I learned. And honest reporting, that's what we need. Just, 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 just to follow up, just, just to follow up, Deborah. But just to oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, but just very quickly, and I agree with almost, as usual, everything you say. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, th I, th I think the, the, the political will was never here. It's not that it ebbed away. It was never here. You know, um, you know, I was in Baghdad just before they were watching on TV this massive march, you know, marches taking place. I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, in the QDG, and I said, what's the, what's, the, what's the mood like? And he said, my mother is in one of these marches. Yeah? So, so that, is, that was the problem. You know, um, unfortunately, you did not have support you deserved. To, to, to go into a war which was seen as based on a lie, a series of lies. The, the, the main, I think the main fault of the media uh, was, as, as uh, Deborah said, that, that you know, they simply were not critical enough. 
You know, if anyone examined that dodgy dossier for any length of time, it fell apart. You know, I sat through every single day of the Hutton inquiry, and you know how it was put together was was. If, 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 if the results weren't so tragic, so devastating, it was farcical. You know, any snippet of inte so-called intelligence being pushed in, you know, embellished. Um, and, and I think that's where the media fell down, that, you know, we did not criticize the government, or rather, that's not, that's not the right word, but we did not examine the government properly when, when, when they presented this falsehood which took us into and, and, and yet I think just before I take your question I, yet I think in comparison to the American media if you listen to John Humphreys on the Today program uh, before the war during the war and after the war it was a great deal more penetrating than anything you heard well I'm not sure before the, the war you know, the New York Times and you know Judith Miller and all that they, they, they did an awful lot to beat the drama of war you know, yeah, but war. once the war had started I think uh, my view is the American media rolled over. It was part of 9-11. It could not be questioned. To do so was virtually unpatriotic. But, but yeah, gentlemen... Had nothing to do with 9-11. That's the point. The whole point. Of course. None of you. I'm uh, pointing that course. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. I, I, I don't think anyone in this room, I may be you speaking disagree. out of turn, I don't think anyone would disagree with you, but that's not the point at the moment. Gentlemen, just at the back, Thank final you. question. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a small commentary. I'm Alia Samuk, originally come from Iraq. Uh, you know, Richard talked, uh, I agree with him, with one, with one thing only, which is that the Americans are actually quite uh, adapt to learning from their mistakes. And if one, for example, study the Vietnam exp experiment, the Vietnam history, the Americans were quite ingenious in discovering how the Vietnam, the Vietnam Viet Congs were fighting, and they adopted all kind of countermeasures. But in the end, it actually was a failure. It was a failure, and they went left Vietnam despite all the ingenuity and all the measures they adopted and all the uh, uh, fine machinery, because the Vietnamese people did not want to be occupied. And the same thing in Iraq in here. Uh, in Iraq, the Iraqi people, I was in Iraq only a week ago, actually. And whoever they are, whether they are Shi'is, whether they are Sunnis, whether they are the Mahdi army, whether they are Maliki, whoever they are, all of them, actually, all of them, all of them, despite their differences, do not want occupation, and they don't want foreign forces in Iraq. And the British, whatever they did, I mean, you went in great length with enthusiasm. And I think this enthusiasm pleases a lot of the merchants of war, because it's all about machinery, about you know which machinery is better than the other, which tank is better than the other. But actually, the end result, whatever the British forces have done in Basra, the end would have been exactly the same. Whatever tactics they would have used, and in the presence, in the process, millions of Iraqis and a lot of British innocents' life have lost because they haven't learned history. And I think one has to ask some quite good questions, is why did, which we raised, is why did uh, uh, forces, the British and American forces went into Iraq in the first place? But also one has to go back into history a little bit and say, why did these forces support Saddam in the first place in the 70s? Uh, why did, uh, you know, why did uh, uh, the Americans support fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism in the first place that brought up the, the, the problems that we have in Afghanistan? I think the people of Afghanistan do not want occupation, and I think the British will have to withdraw. And I think any innocent lives, whether it's on the Afghanistan side, on the British side, innocent, innocent soldiers, teenagers, 18 years old and are being killed completely uh, without any reason because the lessons of history have not been learned. People do not want to be occupied and also people, you know, you talk about fundamentalism in Iraq, about Qaeda in Iraq. Actually, the Qaeda lost in Iraq not because of tactics of Patriots or whatever, because the Sunni people of the Ambar presence, and if you are in Iraq, you will know them. I was in Ambar a few year, about three years ago, and I mixed with them and I talked to lots of people in Ambar. And the Sunni people of Ambar hate Qaeda. They don't like fundamentalism. They don't like women being prevented from going to schools. In Iraq, we had women who occupied top managerial posts historically in Iraq. So whether they are Sunni or Shi'is, they don't like Qaeda. But the question is, where is fundamentalism coming to Iraq? It's coming across from the border from Saudi Arabia. And who's in Saudi Arabia? Who is breeding fundamentalism in Saudi Arabia? What are the ideology that being spread in Saudi Arabia? Is an establishment that is supported by whom? Currently, British and American establishment. So are we, are we going to learn from history? <laughs> and, hist and if we don't learn from history, then all these, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, massacres, all this unnecessary death of millions of people is going to continue whatever tank you use, whatever 
missile you use, whatever plane you use. I'm going to make an appeal to all the to all the Brits in this room that we allow that from an Iraqi to be the final word. And I'd just like to say to the gentleman here who is also an Iraqi, we completely understand, although we can't fully understand, but we understand where you're coming from and what you're saying, because I'm not sure that anyone in Britain today, media, military or government, can stand up and be proud of what, what we, we have did. done in Iraq. And I say this as a journalist, I don't think I have met a journalist who can honestly put their hand up and say, you know, yes, I'm absolutely 100% proud of what we did. Yes, we have our personal triumphs. The gentleman there, I'm sure, showed considerable courage in what you were asked to do. But I don't think anyone in Britain today is proud of the record in Iraq. To go back to your point, uh, we throw it forward into Afghanistan and possibly we see some of the same mistakes being made today. I'll just finish on one note from Richard's book. Not his words, the words of Rudyard Kipling, who wrote at the end of the Boer War in a poem called The Lesson. It was our fault and our very great fault, and now we must turn it to use. I wonder, will we? Yeah. Thank you very much for coming this evening, and thank you to the panelists, Richard, Deborah, and uh, Kim. Thank you very much for a stimulating well, discussion, and please continue afterwards.